Welcome to the Photo Focus Q&A Show. We're back. This is going to be our pilot episode for the return of the Q&A Show. I'll uh-huh. be one of your co-hosts. I'm Ron Pepper. The, and over there I'm... is Rob Maroto. How's it going, hey, Rob? Ron, how's it going? <laughs> All right. Hey, I'm excited. I've been wanting to bring back the Q&A Show for some time, and everything kind of worked out. One reason is thanks to our sponsor, Photomatics, for HDR, high dynamic range photography, the granddaddy that kind of brought it to photography. Uh, in fact, we have a question today that's perfect to talk about HDR, so we don't even have to make a commercial. We'll just, we're going to talk about HDR uh, a little bit later, but you can uh, download and try it at hdrsoft.com, free trial. All right. Well, simple podcast we used to do where we have photo focus readers and listeners send us in some questions. So for this first episode, we asked for some questions to come in and we just, we got a few. And uh, one of the reasons to do this show is to say we're back and please send us your questions. And you can do that at photofocus.com slash questions. All the details are there. You can send text or audio questions and we'll do both of those today. So shall we? uh, Perfect. Let's do that. I'm just going to put up a banner in case you happen to see us live. We are recording this to go out as audio, but you're welcome to uh, chime in if you want to as well. And our first question. Mm -hmm. All right. Our first question of the new season the new new and improved q a podcast uh we will go with um all right coming from donna snyder in oregon she says i seem to have more than she should (laughs) noise in her images especially back uh hold on a second sorry i'm starting out the new q a podcast by not reading is very well Uh, (laughs) she has a bit too much noise in her photos and seems like She'd like to be able to remove it. How do I use and which method is the best? So it's not just my reading. It's also the writing. Uh, She says, I have Corel Paint Shop 2022. That's kind of unusual. And uh, Adobe uh, CC, Photoshop CC. I go through each of the noise adjustments, but can never get it correct. Mm. Um, She says, when adjusting the photos, they may look pretty good when she takes them. Um, but when she looks at it 100% size, it looks really bad. Gotcha. So, well, um, yeah, the noise is a big issue. What do you, you want to start that Rob? Well, you know, uh, okay. So let's give our viewers and listeners just a little bit of a background on who we are, because I think that'll set the tone for where some of my answers are coming from. So my name is Rob Moroto. I am a, commercial, architectural, and interiors photographers. So I take things that don't move. And because of that, noise isn't going to be a big issue for me because at ISO 100, there's pretty much no noise. And I get to keep my shutter open for as long as I need. So right. this is a, this is an interesting one, but I've got a few tips here. And I know well, that- the, That's the first I'm, one, right? Is I, yeah. ISO is the first one, right? I, so it's the first one, but then uh, Ron, I'm, I'm going to let you tell everyone where you're from so that, you know, <laughs> they can know you too. <laughs> uh, we're on photo focus. So, uh, you know, we've, we've all, you and I have been doing a few podcasts recently, so I figured most people probably know, but I am uh, a Bay area photographer. I specialize in um, a lot of things that don't move as well uh, as my specialty. I do panoramas, but they're actually, that's one of the challenges with panoramas is when things are moving. So noise and things come into play. Everything comes into play when you're shooting the way I shoot. So I've um, been doing it for 20 some years, I mean, at least professionally and uh, as a hobby before that. And uh, yeah, just um, kind of, a, I've become more of a generalist over the last few years because I wanted to get more into lighting and more into portraits, more into uh, just getting into the art of it all because I grew up with, panoramas where there's not really an art involved. It's very technical. So you, you want to make the space look the best you can, and maybe you'll choose the best, best vantage point. There's a lot to consider, but art, not so much. So, so when we get, start talking about that, that's my area. That's a little bit more new. 
but so I, I think um, I think between the two of us, we have a lot of a lot of good technical backgrounds, so we should be able to help out. Yeah. So like the first thing that comes to my mind is it's just going to be just the standard. You know, the higher your ISO, the more noise. The longer your shutter is open, the more noise. And then the other thing that uh, comes into my mind is going to be what are you shooting with? Right. Mm -hmm. Like I know that. Uh, like in our arsenal, like for my team, we've got anywhere from a, we shoot all cannons, Canon and Fuji stuff. So with our cannons, if we've got a 5D Mark IV, 5D, uh, 5D SR, uh, those are going to have less noise than say our 60, 60 Mark IIs or the 7D that we have for training. And actually, you know what? Our Canon RPs aren't that bad, but the older the camera, of course, the more noise there is. And the, oh, let's see now. My favorite is my Canon 5 DSR because it's 50 megapixels. But even though I shoot at 50 megapixels, I don't deliver at 50 megapixels. So right. uh, I could shoot at ISO 3200, deliver a picture that's, say, you know, uh, 18 megapixels. And it'll still look great because all that noise is just shrunken out of the picture. When you reduce but, the size, when you reduce the size, it is much less noticeable. Yeah, exactly. It's like you have a, a grainy picture. You take down the size, and then all of a sudden, you can't see the grain because, well, let's face it, grain is yeah. small, and yeah. we're, well, we're just well, Rob. Ready. I had, I guess, I had butterflies trying to read the first question because she mentioned that she's using a phone, so that that makes a lot of sense. That the um, the sensors yeah. are smaller, and noise is noise is more pronounced with what he mentioned already is high ISO. Uh, it's also more pronounced with uh, smaller sensors mm -hmm. and it's exponentially more in underexposed areas. So yeah. the, the one, of the, one of the things with a phone, there are a lot of technical ways to, to fight noise that Rob was talking about with a phone. The best thing you can do is <laughs> be under good lighting, <laughs> good light <laughs> because, um, Hey man, the, these phones are getting amazing cameras now. They're, they're, I can't believe how good my iPhone camera is, but mm -hmm. just a few years ago, they weren't as much and they, they still have small sensors. So if you're, if you have a little bit of an older phone, the one, of, one of the best things to do is just don't try not to shoot in low light because that's when the noise really jumps out. Yeah. But so those are the ways to kind of avoid it. But when you've got it already, do you have a favorite tool for removing it? Or you're a Lightroom guy, I think, right? But do you have a I favorite am. tool for removing And you know, I'm, I'm a Lightroom guy, but I'm also one of those guys that does volume. And we do, uh, we do a, say, anywhere from 50 to 100 photos at a photo shoot because we're shooting house, typically you're shooting houses, right? Mm -hmm. And so we don't have time to adjust noise for every single image independently. We need to be able to batch it. And mm -hmm. so there's some great batching uh noise products out there like noiseware and um oh topaz labs has one i think that's a good one yeah yeah and so there's a whole bunch out there but for us our simple way of doing it is simply just sliding down the noise of the noise slider in lightroom around 10 20 points and then because we shoot with cameras that are around 26 megapixels and we're ex exporting that around 18 megapixels, all the noise just disappears with those yeah. two things. Yeah. Yeah. With that kind of shooting, when you're really, Hey, you're a professional, you're in there deliberately with a plan, you've got the right equipment. It's pretty easy to avoid noise. I guess it's when is when you're in the wrong situation with the wrong equipment. But I mean, just to add, just to kind of finish that off, to add a couple, um, I used to, okay. I got an email literally maybe a week ago from neat image, which I didn't know existed anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, I had bought their plugin a long time ago and I was on the email list. They are out and they have a new version. So I just checked before this because I saw the question and I saw it's 39 bucks. I might've been euros. I'm not sure, but I know that's a, a very, I mean, it's been around for a long time. It's really well developed. Should be a good um, product. Mm -hmm. I also used for a little while noise ninja and I yeah. just did a quick check to see if they're still around and they are. So yeah, noise, it's funny, noise is getting to be less and less of an issue. For me, it's an issue with my small sensor of a Micro Four Third system. I use an Olympus system. Mm -hmm. There's more noise than my full frame cameras. Yeah. And also I use one of these um, Theta 360 cameras that has 
thankfully, mm. they've gone to, I want to say, you'll know this probably, Rob, is it one and a half inch sensor from a, from less? It, anyway, it was small. It's gotten a little bit bigger mm-hmm. and it's, and it, and it has had the expected improvement in noise, not as good as our SLRs, but yeah. way better. So the small sensor oh, cool. is what, if you want to avoid noise, avoid a small sensor, right? <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah. And the other thing that I, I, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I start this, this question reminded me of when, when did I find noise to be a huge problem? And the last time I saw, I think I remember having noises being a very big problems was I was shooting this wedding and the, the bride and groom asked that during the dance and during, um, during the first dance that there be no flash photography. And so imagine first dance, bride and groom, and then bride and the, bride and the father, but no flash. So of course people are moving quite quickly. And I still had my, I think I had a 70, 70 to 200, 2.8. And I had it at 2.8, but still I had to shoot it around, I think 1600 ISO, mm-hmm. just so that I could, stop the motion and there was a few times that you know you slow it down to one four hundredth of a second and you try and move with the bride and groom bride and groom and get the background to bl- do that motion blur thing while you still keep them in focus right um and that's tough wait uh, for them but, to wait for them to get into the good light yeah Maybe. right and so <laughs> it's times like that where i could see that noise would become a problem because yes you cannot change you're, you have to deal with using higher ISOs and you have to deal with your shutter speed and you have mm-hmm. to deal with the fact that there's no extra light. Yeah. And for that, the yeah. only thing Con- I can say is... photography would be like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you would need a good camera to be able to work with low light situations. I think Nikons and, Nikons and Sonys are probably going to be your best bet for those. Fujis are pretty good, but they don't focus as well in the dark, uh, I've found. And, um, yeah, so I, ge- I guess the gear is a big one when, when we're talking about low light stuff. Yeah. I mean, noise is, noise is one of those that there's no one solution. And it's one of those things that we are photographers and we have to deal with. And sometimes but in what you do most of the time, you've got it pretty well solved, but someone that's shooting concerts, it's, I mean, it's tough, like you said, to get the, because there's so much motion and the lighting is so unpredictable. <laughs> and I mean, that's, yeah, it can be tough. Right, but yeah, yeah. The, uh, like you know, the, that's one of the th- that's one of the things about Q and A. You know, I I was joking around how I wanted to call this the "It Depends" podcast because that's usually <laughs> the answer, and then you just go. We can talk about all the ins and outs, and that's how we should do it. But um, let's leave that one there and go on to our next question, which is uh, from uh, Susha Mishra in India. So we're going oh, wow. international already. Episode one. Great. Right. Well, we're we're actually got international already because. You're in a different country than I'm in. Yes, but quite frankly, physically, we're probably around, I don't know, 100 miles from each other. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm in uh, San Francisco. It's already uh, 100 miles just to get to Oregon. More, actually. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah, I thought you were uh, just like right below Vancouver Island. So uh, I grew up, grew up in Washington where, yeah, I was up there in Vancouver quite a bit. Yeah. So I, that's why some people ask me if I'm Canadian and I go... I guess I give something off. I think it's, I usually <laughs> I, I say it's you're polite. <laughs> well, it's polite. I'm, I'm one, like I want people to be happy. I'm a, you know, I come from the hospitality industry. So I'm kind of a pleaser and I'm goofy. That's what it is. I'm goofy. That's that. There you have it. Ron Pepper <laughs> has just called all Canadians goofy. <laughs> yep. That's I'll like, take a, it. yeah, you know, Jim Carrey and, <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, question two from Sushma. Um, no, this one, again, something we could continue talking about quite a bit is um, they say editing is something that I can't get my hands on. I think that's kind of like we'd say can't get my head around kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the kind of editing that is in contests for winning photos, I'm kind of editing this as I go because yeah. it's written kind of funny. Uh, any easy methods of editing images so the subjects pop and he goes or she, I'm not quite sure, um, goes on to mention something about being a dumb question, but no, no, don't say that. And, and then they mentioned that they majorly shoot wildlife and nature. 
Okay. So basically we're asking what kind of editing to make subjects pop. Mm. And I'm glad they said that part to talk about subjects pop because with editing to make a photo go from something to fabulous, I mean, that's really, <laughs> I don't know how long we have to talk, but, yeah. uh, but the subjects, I mean, do you want to start? Do you want me to start with a few ideas? Well, you know what? I'll let you start why, on this one. I think I took over the last one there. That's good. Um, well, I would first, I would say, well, I'll start out a little bit sounding a little negative, but I'll bring it back, bring it back around. Okay. Is because I went through a, I went through a period where, uh, like for instance, a couple of times, I guess I thought, okay, I'm a panoramic guy and pretty much anything I shoot is going to look fabulous because it's, it had a cool factor back then when mm -hmm. not anybody could do this. You couldn't just buy a 360 camera. You had to really work and plan and have the equipment and everything. So I thought I was so cool. And I just started realizing very quickly that there's nothing that special about it. Yeah. It's cool that it spins around, but that's it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I went through another period where I got uh, us panoramic people are big into bracketing and HDR to solve lighting problems. So I got into HDR when that came out. So early when, it was coming to the photography world in the 2000, early 2000s. And I thought, I have this tool here, everything. I'm going to make a great photo because I have this secret weapon. Well, it doesn't mean my images were good. I mean, it didn't mean that the subject was great. It didn't mean that I had, a, I had done a good job in composition or plan. It didn't mean any of that. So I guess what I'm saying is start with making sure you have a really great composition and subject and light. So mm -hmm. for, for instance, one of the first things I learned when I got back, got into digital photography is a really paid attention to don't look for a great subject, look for great light. So there are so many things you can do. So I guess what I wanted to <laughs> say to, um, Mr. Or Mrs. Mishra <laughs> that I wanted to say is start from the beginning of, you know, let's get a, let's get an image that with the editing is going to be great. Yeah. And then, um, to bring it around, if you're, if you're new to doing the editing, this is one of the few times I would recognize recognize one of the first times I would recommend presets because okay. I really am not a preset guy, but learning what's possible is a really great reason to use presets. So if you have Lightroom, if you have a, uh, well, with wildlife and nature photos, um, I'm always talking about presets and photomatics because there's all those questions about which one to use. Uh, uh, so photomatics, Lightroom, um, What's another good preset application? I'm not quite sure at the moment, but using those, just going through all the styles that can be used can really give you ideas into ways of, of making those pop. And then when something gets close or you really like it already, you can look at what settings were, the, which settings did the preset apply? <laughs> and yeah. that's a really great way to learn. So that's my first thing is um, see what's possible with the presets. And most of the, I think a lot of applications have them. Lightroom and Photomatics are the ones that I use probably the most, but look at your editing software. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll read the question back to myself while, while you're talking to see if I missed anything. But uh, then, I mean, <laughs> where do you start with, with, um, yeah, you're talking about, uh, I, I would say the, the best things, if, if I'm not using presets, the first thing I go to is in Lightroom, I go to the blacks and the whites. So that I, mm -hmm. you know, make those, those, I like the crushed blacks. I like the whites to be clean. So I go right there, uh, go to contrast. And then, then I'd recommend those kinds of tools. Like, uh, some of these, some people, it's not really my thing, but some people that spend a lot of time customizing their, their shots, they, they do a lot more after the shoot than the shoot. Mm -hmm. And there's so many tools to paint in areas and change a color in one area and select out a subject and adjust those. So you can really go so far. And I think I want to leave it there because we, we could again, go so far. Well, you know, that's exactly where, well, where I was going to pick up on was the fact that when anything like wildlife or nature, um, I do a lot of that with just my personal art photography, which I really don't put out there uh, a lot because that kind of art stuff is for me, it's personal. I want it. It's mine. I don't share it because I'm the one that wants to see it. Um, I don't want anyone to see. Well, <laughs> are you, are you afraid? Are you afraid of success? In there? 
yeah, you'll you'll come over to my place and I'll show you the photos that I've got of uh, my art stuff because that's where I want it. I want to be the owner of that stuff because it, it brings back memories for me. But when I'm looking at stuff like this, it all becomes a question of have I isolated my subject matter? Have I isolated my focal point of my image? So, for example, if you look at, oh, I don't know how many of us are looking at this uh visual recording of this podcast uh it is available on facebook and youtube and what were those other social medias that we don't really know about oh that we're streaming yeah um odyssey and float odyssey and float so you can find us on odyssey and float now <laughs> <laughs> but uh so what one of the things that you'll notice about what ron and i are doing on camera is we are actually lighting ourselves to look different and separating ourselves from our backgrounds and i'm separating myself from a background you using a godox cl10 webcast light and it's great it makes my entire background blue or yellow or red or whatever i want to because what that does is it makes me separate from the background now in wildlife when i shoot those here's a great tip when you get into photoshop use the subject uh, the, the object recognition selection tool and select, select subject, right? Select subject tool. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. select whatever it is, whether it is a bird on a post or whether it's a bear eating a deer or whatever you have shot that is wildlifey, select that, take everything else and then change it. So your foreground image, whatever that is, increase the, uh, exposure of that slightly and decrease the exposure of your background that'll create separation you can even change things like color temperature so you make your background cooler than your foreground you can change the uh you can actually add a gaussian blur to your background to make it mm -hmm. look like it's more shallow depth of field and all these little things will help separate the background from the foreground and drive attention to whatever your subject matter is Nature photos, I do that all the time with, um, I, I, live in, uh, I live in Vancouver Island uh, most of the time. And out here, we've got rainforest all over the place. And so whenever we go through there, we take pictures. I love seeing those little streams of light, but I make sure that those are the center points of my images. And then you can really darken the shadows, uh, neutralize some of the, the highlights and make it look very ephemeral or you can make it look like it's a, a dark forest, green forest, whatever you like. But you can really isolate what you want to focus on and make that stand out and really drop off the rest. And it's uh, it's really cool. I, I like dissecting a photo that way and saying, this is my subject matter. This tree is the focal point of this shot in the forest. And then accentuating that by separating it from your background. Yeah, that, that's one of, that's kind of a portraits 101 is have a blurry background and a sharp subject. And that can apply to, certainly apply to wildlife. And the best wildlife stuff is a sharp subject and then a blurry in a savanna or something like that back there. Yeah, agreed. Um, I would say if you're, you're, they're asking what kind of editing can I do? I mean, I would, I would bring up a poker adage. You can learn the game in 10, the game takes 10 minutes to learn and a lifetime to master or something along that line. <laughs> and you know, I mean, when yeah. you're getting to what kind of, what you want to do with images, man, I, I just saw a, uh, uh, part of my YouTube photography portion of my day. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think it was, um, Vanessa joy that does, has a good YouTube channel. And she was talking about the, how do I feel about, where photography ends and Photoshop art begins or, do, you know, how do I feel about that? Yeah. I, I want to get a great photo, but I really appreciate the Photoshop art. And yeah, I mean, YouTube rabbit holes are, I learned a ton on now it's LinkedIn learning. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I have a, I have a, I have a uh, title there about 360 photography, uh, but LinkedIn learning used to be lynda.com. And I spent so many hours at the gym um, watching Deke McClellan or McKellen, I'm sorry, Deke, but man, he's a fast talking, real expert on Photoshop. And 
I, oof, I would recommend if you want to really dive in, that's a good course um, on Photoshop. So. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know what? One simple thing that you might want to try uh, that will help focus your images onto your subject matter, play with your vignette. I think that was the first thing that I started playing with when I was uh, starting out was just creating and taking away the vignette of an image. And that will create a huge mm -hmm. difference. That has a bit of a simplifying and focusing the eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Sushma, sorry, we again, I, what we were saying on the other podcast the first time is we could go on all day about that one, but let's, uh, let's go to um, our third question we have written in. And then we have an audio question that someone sent in. Okay. Um, one, one more from Wade Brook, uh, artbywade.com. I don't know if you wanted me, why not point that out, right? Uh, he, he wrote in the comments on the, the photo focus page, is there a good, and he wants to say, actually, is there a great resource for selling prints of our work? Hmm. Uh, I know you need good marketing strategy and good presence, meaning, and he wrote blog, social, etc. but what else? Uh, and well, let me better... start this one off. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to start this one off to say, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not one of those artists, unfortunately. I'm so um, low on this one, huh? <laughs> yeah, you are. You know what? We need, we need to get like uh, a Peter Lick or... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Why am I blanking on artists? We know well, so many. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, I, I can... Right. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, that's one of the things with the Q&A show. The intention here is if we get questions about, say, wedding photography, well, you have some background, but if we have questions that we really don't know, a lot of times we wouldn't choose them, but it's new and we just have a few to start with. And we'll at, see if we can't get some other um, photo focus authors or even just people that are just are new to the community on to do that. And it'll be I fun. Be great. But I, yeah, I, more people I, on. yeah, no, that'll be, that's exactly the idea. It won't always be Ron and Rob. So everybody's confused. You can call me Pepper if you want. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a few things, Wade. <laughs> uh, first, he there are two. We have two subjects: is being found so that someone might choose to buy it, and then there's the part about getting it printed and sold, paid and shipped. I think those are two kind of separate things, at least for me. Um, it, because he's already he's already realizing you need to have a marketing strategy and a good presence, mm -hmm. and uh, that's uh, <laughs> like a lot of businesses, man. It always comes down to sales, right? You can be an yeah. expert at something, but like I'd be better off if I were better at sales. And so, I think you're on the right track there, uh, Wade. But one way, well, let me let me <laughs> tell you a direct one. One way of building that audience is things like guess what blogging and podcasting and being involved in that community where you're really getting your name out there and passed along. Now I realize this one is really, we're talking to and with other photographers. So it's not really the point the, this, this kind of one is not where you're going to get a bunch of sales, but being involved in the community is always really good. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been watching, um, I've been watching the, uh, the emergence of NFTs, which is uh, a new way of, um, recording who owns what and that's there's all this excitement about it but what people are realizing is that it comes down to being found you have to market that they have to you have to announce the big they're calling it the big drop and they have to be already known to have the audience for people to want to buy those and it's the same thing i think so yeah uh, and, and that that also um Part of his question that I didn't finish reading, he said, are we better off only selling numbered and signed editions? Oh, by the way, he said, thanks. And I'm looking forward to the return of the Q&A show. So he's already <laughs> a, he a in the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, me disappoint. You're, you're doing that. <laughs> um, were you expecting Rich and uh, Scott? I, I used to do these uh, some years ago, too. So we're just bringing it back. But hey, I mean, send, uh, send comments. Who do you want to see on? Well, let's see what I can do. So, uh, but selling the numbered and signed editions is also a lot like that NFT thing where you're, you're, you can release a certain number of them if it's digital, but if they're printed, um, to me, that's the, the balance between, do you want to have, are you trying to find more sales probably at a lesser amount compared to, um, making them 
more scarce and therefore hopefully more valuable by having them signed and numbered. And I wish I, I wish I had a good answer for you because, you know, I, I see people at the, the fair the, that have the booth and they're selling direct and there's a different, there's a, no, but there's more value to that than when you um, order from smug bug smug mug is the one I use. I was going to bring it around to that and say that, you know, there are, there are these, um, services that will take care of the, the logistics for you and, um, won't help you be found so much as they will take care of, um, taking payment and they take a cut of course, and then they print it and ship it. Um, smug mug is good. A little bit on the expensive side. I think, um, I know fine art America is, um, is popular with, uh, people in this group that, um, we were, we were talking about unrelated to this show. We were talking about fine art America the other day. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, I, it's one of those things that you have to decide which way you're going to go on with your business. Rob isn't doing it. Um, I rarely sell stuff that are prints yeah. and but usually I'm, I'm commissioned to do something and then I give it to the client compared to uh, creating the art and then being found. So, uh, but when that does happen, when I'm asked to, can I, people ask me if they can license images from time to time and, uh, that is not marketed. <laughs> That's just being found. So, yeah. um, I don't know what, um, actually Rob, you're good at social media. I know you are. Um, do you have some you know, tips on it, the, the generally being found part? The, the generally being found part is just accidental. It's always accidental, right? Uh, I know that, um, I've got a few friends that are doing more, I want to say lifestyle photography and some of their photos get picked up by those, uh, those travel Stop. and oh. landscape kind of uh, Instagram accounts that just share great photos. Right. Hmm. And then they get one or two photos that get shown on those and then bam, they have a thousand new followers and that kind of stuff is great. So, you know, just posting, tagging, um, you know, tagging people t uh, using hashtags, all that stuff is good. Um, but I got to say the one person that I, I found to be really really exceptionally good at their art stuff um well peter leck of course everyone knows about him and seen his stores all over uh the tourist capitals of america Airport. um but the the guy that i'm thinking of is i uh, i met him and his brother and they work out of uh, uh, I think it was Lahaina in Maui mm -hmm. and they have a little stand where they sell photos on the weekend market and they sell prints left, right and center. And right. one of the key things with them is they know their demographic. The, the, the weekly market is on the water. It's on, it's where all the charter boats are about to head out from. It's where, uh, everyone goes before going to the beach. It's it's Maui, right? And they've got a booth set up there. And what they're selling are pictures of whales and dolphins and uh, anything underwater. And essentially what they are are deep sea divers, photographers. Their full-time job is working with Oh, shoot. Which is it now? It's one of those institutes that wa looks after, uh, that does research on whales and whale migration. And they're hired on by this comp this organization to go out and photograph the whales. What a dream but job. They are allowed to keep all their photographs and do with whatever they want, as long as they provide the photographs to the research facility to be able to monitor the migration of the whales. And so they're able to get in like 10 feet away from whales and take them with ultra wide lenses and just amazing photos. But the reason that they're successful is because they've taken all this material, they've got the stuff and then they're just right there in the middle of the tourist town, in the middle of the tourist market, right in front of the ocean. And they got what the tourists want. And it is, 
that's a business model for anybody, right? That, that's location, 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 right? Have the right location, have the right product at the right timing. You've got tourists that are coming in wanting a souvenir before they go home and they love the ocean. <laughs> there's that's just an amazing like no brainer right there. And if there's a way that you can find where your your art is niche and you have a niche clientele and you know where they're going to be all the time and you can set up there. Great. Yeah. Well, this this goes yeah. back to the question we had before Sushma about just award winning images because the first time I went to Hawaii I decided that I my one of my biggest tips for photography to improve your photography is go to Hawaii <laughs> because <laughs> there is it was hard to take bad pictures there. It was just, I, I, yeah. When I finally went there, I realized why it's so popular. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, there's a, uh, we're all finding our niche, right? The photography's changed so much where back in, you know, you know, Scott Bourne's day, I say that name because he's doing the podcast before with me and with others. Uh, you get the photos, you license them and you sell prints and that was the business. And yeah, it was at least for, for yourself. And now, man, there are a bunch of ways to do it. We're all finding unusual things. I didn't, I didn't think I'd be back shooting real estate photography at my, at my age because I did that when I was starting out, but Hey, the business has changed and it's very workable now. It's really good. So here we are. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so yeah, wait, I hope, I hope I need to uh, YouTube and doing courses. So yeah, we're all in the same boat there. Yeah. Um, let's do one more question. I thought it was going to be a short episode, but it's going to be a normal one, but, uh, because we have one more that came in an audio. Um, I was asking some people to do audio and, um, and then I got a personal response. Perfect. Hi, Ron, Katie from California here. Can you share your best tips for taking beautiful interior photographs that look natural and have authentic colors? Thank you. It's like, she knows you. <laughs> <laughs> because is it, and this isn't scripted at all no <laughs> no it was not scripted but this is okay uh we we, sh we should say that the two of us we've done live real estate q a shows before mm -hmm. they're real estate oriented directly and this is i mean I, this... I can i can talk about this but rob is has some really great um you know this is totally workflows yeah, this is not only the wheelhouse, this is my house. It's, yeah. um, <laughs> it's. <laughs> well, let, let uh, me, let me explain a little bit the problem for anybody mm -hmm. that, because she's asking about interiors. So, uh, I often say that real estate photography is harder than it seems or looks from the outside and real estate photographers don't get enough credit nor money. <laughs> So be, yeah. And because one of the, one of the challenges is varying types of light, man-made and the sun and the man-made ones can have different color temperatures. The sun has its own color temperature. So it's a constant yeah. battle. No matter how you're shooting it, you have to solve that problem. We don't have to solve noise. That's really not a big deal. We have to solve the different colors. So, um, when I take, if I take an image at a white balance that has, that's set one way, then the sun will look the wrong color and then vice versa. If I shoot for natural light, then the man-made light will look the wrong color and you have to manage that. So I'll, I give the problem. You give some, you give your first, I, you have a few solutions, but what, what do you think? You know what? It's uh, it's funny. I've been asked this questions over and over and over and over again. And it's the, I think it's like a repeating question that keeps on coming up within all of our Q and A's. And so uh good news anyone that's out there that wants to get into real estate photography i have a course that's going to be launching very very soon so is, find me at, yep. <laughs> find me at robmoroto.com and uh sign up there and once it launches i'll send out an email i'll follow me anywhere that you can at rob Moroto. and if you want to follow me on patreon that really helps me out too uh mm. <laughs> but essentially the key problem with uh, mixed lighting is that we allow the lighting to mix and the easiest way to get rid of that is to get rid of the competing lights so if 
you've probably seen this out there already where there's a lot of there's a new trend where a lot of interiors are actually just shut with all the lights off because then you're just dealing with the light that's coming through the windows and it's one light source and so you don't have this mixed color and if you do your hdr right then it looks great it looks fantastic but don't or, the, don't the clients expect they'll, they'll get the results and say why aren't the lights on that's i've um, heard that a you lot know too. I've actually started getting clients asking me to turn the lights off and keep the lights oh, off. I would love and that. Be great. They want that. <laughs> they want that architectural digest look, which is with the lights off. And it's um, it's interesting. I I don't know if I like it. It's um, it doesn't really show off the 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 interior lighting. And let's face it, lighting costs a lot of money, and lighting is part of the design for the interiors so the second way of doing this is the exact opposite is to shoot right at twilight where you shoot around half an hour after sunset and so now all your windows are blue and mm -hmm. the inside is lit just with your interior lights and now of course if you have mixed lighting inside then you're then you're right. you know you still have your problem but if all you have inside are LEDs that are all 2700 Kelvin, then it's all going to look great because you only have to color balance to that one light source. And so those are two very easy ways of doing it where you just limit it to one color source. Um, and then aside from that, if you want to fix it another way, uh, the other easy way is to use flash and overpower all the tungsten uh, interior lights right. and use the power of the sun and use the power of your flash and overpower any other light source so you have one consistent light color that way mm -hmm. so those are my those are my uh two major well this simplified ways of uh describing it uh if you want to see how i do the workflow for all of that and how to make it simple uh join my course or join my patreon and i'll go into i'll go into hours of depth there yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i was gonna throw out one um one uh, one method that is uh if you're bracketing and combining them for hdr or fusion if you don't know about fusion and you're not happy with your hdr check out fusion <laughs> it yeah. has a natural result much easier so that's one way already uh, so two, two things within that I, I, I experiment with in, uh, either photomatics or Lightroom, wherever the raw conversion happens, I change the white balance for each individual bracketed frame. So that reduces the difference, not a hundred percent because they're still going to be combined. But if you, uh, white balance for the sun on the darkest ones where the sun's coming in and then the other way around for the brighter ones, then that reduces the problem a lot. It all depends on what you're shooting for. Real estate photography is not the high end. You don't have to be so perfect as your ar architectural digest. So this is another thing that would change how you handle it. Um, another way is when you bracket, add in one, usually just a TTL flash shot. And that mm -hmm. gives you uh, some better color in one of the frames. And then when you combine that, you'll see the difference. So you can play around with the way you'd shoot it, like shooting a bracketed, say, a set of five, and then one extra with the flash. Um, let's not go Let's not go too deep because you have a really great flash workflow that you might have to save for your, uh, maybe for Patreon or something, because <laughs> there's a, a more elaborate way of doing that, that that works really well. But you really have to be, it, it takes, it's a more sophisticated workflow in shooting, and in software and in just knowledge of how to use blending modes and white balance and all this stuff. So that's something you know, that I would, I would say, check out, you know, get a hold of Rob for more on that. Right. You know, the other way that I liked, uh, uh, doing it, uh, was with photomatics in the, when you're blending it, there is the option to blend back in one layer or one, um, of the bracketed shots. And what I found is that if you bracket a higher, uh, higher bracket, so your plus one or your plus, uh, plus two, and bring that back in a bit, here's the thing with light. If you have mixed lighting, one is going to dominate over the other. 
And when you bring it up to the point where the non-dominant one gets blown out, or the, sorry, the dominant one gets blown out and non-dominant one stays, you kind of can uh, use that white balance to help recolor your image. And mm -hmm. I know that's a, it's, it's hard to explain without actually doing demonstration on this one. But if you go into Photomax and you bring back the blend in one layer thing, it, mm -hmm. I find that that helps bring the color back. Yeah, that's the that, that's the idea. That was why can't we bring back part of one? Yeah, there's a lot of uses for that, and that's a little bit like the other methods. And another way of doing kind of the same thing is using the color from one of the images. I mean, Rob yeah. Rob uh, taught me or mentioned something one day that with his, your method of doing color with a flash one, you can have a black and white layer, and your the flash version will color it. Use so, and I tried it, and it definitely works. So, um, uh, Patreon Patreon dot com slash Rob Maroto. It, that's that's it. Yeah, <laughs> somebody's but, asking that in the comments. Oh, okay, perfect. Shout but out. Yeah, oh, no, should we do definitely. shout outs on this show? We this is this is the uh, pilot inaugural episode. We can kind of shape it how we want. Oh, and perfect. I, de I decided to go ahead and live stream this just for fun. Why not? <laughs> and um, one person watching comes from when we used to do the real estate ones on the photomatics page on Facebook. Oh yeah. yeah. Karen. So, Hey, Karen, Ah, uh, Karen's and, back. Hello, Karen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was like, she was one of, um, always asking questions. Every episode is great. So I feel like I know Karen a little bit anyway. And she says, what is Patreon? <laughs> <laughs> Patreon um, is a lifeline for starving artists like me. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would say the best way is just to, um, here we go. I can actually pop that up. Um, I would just go to patreon.com slash Rob Moreau to check it out. Um, mm -hmm. and I won't talk about that one, but I'll throw it up there just for fun. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's, um, let's wrap it up. I thought okay. we were going to do a quick little first episode, but we're, we, you know, we're out 45 minutes. You so we um, never had a phone call that was less than like half an hour. So I'm not surprised. We, oh, you and I, I know, but yeah. I'm trying to move it along because people are listening and we're, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we definitely want feedback on what you'd like to see from the show. And like I said, photo, uh, folk, so many things start with photo, photomatics, photo focus, um, photofocus.com slash questions. And you can send in your questions in various ways. I love doing the audio. I just think it's a fun way to do it. You get a little more feel for what people are asking. More of the personality comes in. So if, if you're up for it, just, Record that on your phone on the voice memo app. You just hit share. You go there. The email address is on there, but it's guess what? Questions at photofocus.com. So, uh, and you can just send the audio file and we'll get it and we'll choose some for next time. Um, what else about the show is, uh, yeah, um, no, I already said that is just to give us feedback, uh, things you would like to see. Maybe people you'd like to ask on if you have a photo focus author that you know from photo focus that you'd like to get to hear on audio let let me know uh last time we had a meeting with the authors i i mentioned this happening and and um, a lot of people said they would love to do it even though they consider themselves writers so <laughs> uh and you can personally i just like rob i have my vanity url ronpepper.com you can kind of see what i'm doing there and um again uh, check out our sponsor hdrsoft.com you can download photomatics free and if you have questions about that and you write to their support the photography questions typically go to me so you can get me there too and we'll um yep support the heck out of that <laughs> all right thanks again rob on our first episode and uh, we'll be doing this once a month or more depending on some things and um Let's, Whether you'll um, have me back or not. <laughs> well, Rob may or may not be back, but <laughs> no, we're, we're as the as the schedule takes shape. Uh, I you know just like our other show, I would love to host with you and then one other person, but then we get on too long. Really, these Q and A's are good for two people because we're going to go back and forth and we kind of move along and uh, don't have to go. We don't even have to go as deep as we did. It can depend on yeah, depend on the, and the questioner and depend on us. We can do it. So 
Rob, back. thanks for coming. Anything else you want to point out to uh, no, send people? No, I think, I, I think I've uh, plugged myself enough there. Uh, yes. I've got a course coming up. Uh, you can find that at www.robmoroto.com. Uh, you can find me on social media at Rob Moroto and uh, yeah, patreon.com slash Rob Moroto. So find me, you know, send some love. You're going to start seeing Rob more and more on photo focus because I'm bringing them over. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> let's, um, let's head out of here and just say to everyone, we'll see you uh, next month. Please, please, please questions, bring them in, bring them in and we'll, um, pick the ones that we're probably best at answering and uh, take it from there. And uh, until the next show, we're, we'll, you'll see Rob and I and some others for the round table coming up in two weeks. And until next time. All right. Thanks very much. Bye. Okay. Are we done? Are we still live? Are we still recording? What are we doing? Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, put them below and be sure to click on like and subscribe if you have not done so already. And make sure that you click on that little bell so you get notified every time we put up a new video here. And if you want to follow me on Instagram or Facebook, I can be found at Rob Morado. And for those of you who want some more advanced techniques on Photoshop, some free presets and actions, join us on patreon.com slash Rob Morado. That really, really helps me out, helps me fund all of this and keep on putting on some free content onto uh, these platforms. So please do join me there. That's patreon.com slash Rob Morado. And until next time, take care and have fun shooting.